Welcome to Philosophy 103, Introduction to Logic, Unit 3, Propositional Logic. This is Lecture 1, Introduction to Symbolization. We've already learned the definitions for two key components of this unit, statements and propositions. A statement is any complete sentence in any language that is bivalent, that is, having two possible truth values. A proposition, on the other hand, is the meaningful content of a statement. This is an important distinction since the meaning of a statement is independent from the peculiarities of individual languages. While the grammar and syntax of languages varies widely, the meaning articulated in a statement, that is, the proposition, will be the same regardless of the language used to express it. Another way of thinking of it is a proposition is the meaning of a statement abstracted from the language used to express it. Meaning, or propositional content, is what allows us to translate from one language to another. In propositional or sentential logic, we take this abstraction one step further by replacing all the words in a proposition with variables and symbols, thereby freeing ourselves from the ambiguities of ordinary language. This allows us to express and examine the logic of complex ordinary language arguments far more efficiently. And we don't have to go through the hassle of trying to force our premises and conclusions into categorical form, as we did in Aristotelian logic. The first thing we have to learn is to recognize simple propositions. Here are some examples of simple propositions. Dogs are mammals. Ray-Bans are expensive. Cato is a beautiful dog. Rick and Morty is a great TV show. Note that each one is a complete statement that can be assigned a truth value. Each one can be either true or false. But in ordinary language arguments, we might also find complex statements expressing a compound of two or more statements. Note the words and phrases in red. These serve as connectors, which we're going to call logical operators, joining two simple statements together to form a complex proposition. Now that we can recognize the difference between simple and complex propositions, we're ready to begin the process of symbolizing the statements. The process is really very simple. Look to the subject of the statement. Take the first letter of the first word of the subject term and use that capitalized letter to express the whole proposition. Let's look at some simple statements as examples of how to symbolize the proposition. If we have the statement dogs are mammals, we find that the subject term is dogs, which begins with the letter D. So we use this letter to represent the whole statement. We do the same for other examples. Now we've examined all, or eliminated all of the words, grammar, and syntax of each of these statements, and we can think of each of them as a simple proposition represented by a single variable. We can do exactly the same thing for compound statements. First, we identify the subject term of each simple statement and use those letters as the symbols or variables to represent the complex statement. Notice that we've left the connector AND between the two propositions. We'll learn how to symbolize this logical operator in a moment. But suppose, for the sake of argument, we had a complex statement, and the subject of both started with the same letter. In that case, we move to the predicate of the second statement and use the first letter of IT to represent that statement. It is essential that each statement has a unique variable as it represents a distinct proposition. We follow the same procedure for all other compound propositions. Now that we've learned how to symbolize propositions, we're ready to learn how to symbolize the logical operators that form the heart of propositional logic. There are just five logical operators that we have to learn, and each has a unique symbol that represents the logical operation performed on simple propositions. First, there's negation, which is, a symbol, which is symbolized using the tilde. This symbol represents the negation of any simple proposition. It's like adding the phrase, it's not the case that, in front of a statement. Now, 
If we wanted to conjoin any two simple statements, we would use conjunction, which is symbolized by using the dot. This logical operator asserts that both statements are true. But we might also want to say at least one of the two statements is true. This is called disjunction, and it is symbolized using the wedge. Now, in Unit 1, we learned about hypothetical or conditional statements. The if-then statement is very useful in propositional logic, and it is symbolized using the horseshoe symbol. Finally, we have material equivalence, or the biconditional statement, which is symbolized by using the triple bar. Now that we have symbols for our logical operators, we can eliminate any remaining words in our complex propositions, leaving us with completely symbolized complex propositions. dnc becomes d dot c. It's not the case that k becomes tilde k. If k then m becomes k horseshoe m. Either r or f becomes r wedge f. And s if and only if i becomes s triple bar i. Now for a little bit of practice. The statement, this pizza is hot, is a simple proposition. We look to the subject, which is the word pizza, so to symbolize this statement, it simply becomes p. Pizza, the subject term, so we take the letter p and let it represent the whole proposition. You're as cold as ice. Again, a simple proposition. This one becomes y, representing the whole statement. But what about this one? I'll go if you let me. It's clearly a conditional statement, an if-then statement. But notice that the consequent, I'll go, comes before the antecedent, if you'll let me. That's OK. All we have to do in the symbolized proposition is reverse the order giving us the logical meaning of the statement. If y, then i. Here's another interesting one. Think about this ordinary language statement. We see that the logical meaning is really, it's not the case that Cato is a small dog. So, we simply place a tilde in front of k. In our next example, we have a compound of two statements, Cato is alive and Lucia is dead. The word but is a conjunction and therefore logically represents the same meaning as the word and. Thus, we get K dot L. If I were you, I'd stick around, becomes I horseshoe S. Finally, let's look at a disjunction. Either Cato is alive or Lucia is. This disjunction is saying that at least one of these two simple statements is true. Of course, they might both be true, but the logic of the statement tells us that at least one of them must be true. So this statement becomes K wedge L. Now that we've learned how to symbolize simple propositions and complex propositions, as well as the logical operators that connect them, we're ready to deal with even more complex statements. After all, there's no rule in ordinary language that prevents us from combining more than two simple statements together. We could even join a compound statement together with a simple proposition, or a pair of complex statements, or a pair of complex propositions with a simple proposition, and so on. Just like in ordinary language, we use punctuation to indicate the meaning of increasingly complex expressions. But instead of commas, colons, and semicolons, we'll use parentheses, brackets, and braces to indicate the order of logical operations within increasingly complex propositions. Let's start with a simple example. First, we want to identify the symbols we'll use to represent the simple propositions Lucia is dead and Cato is dead, or L and K, respectively. Next, let's eliminate all the rest of the words from the statement, leaving us simply L and K. Finally, we symbolize the conjunction with the dot, and we have L dot K. This symbolized proposition clearly expresses the conjunction of L and K, so we call this a well-formed formula.
We've eliminated all the ambiguity of ordinary language, and we've made the logical implication explicit. We are saying that both L and K are true. Whether or not they really are true is a matter of fact, which could impact the soundness of an argument, but it's not relevant to the validity, which is what we're most concerned with in deduction. But what about this more complex statement? Notice that we have two different logical operations, a disjunction and a negation in this complex statement. First, let's identify the symbols for the two statements, L and K. Now, we have the negation of the disjunction of L and K. It's not the case that L or K. But this, unfortunately, is not a well-formed formula because its meaning is logically ambiguous, and we can't allow ambiguity in dedu deduction. Thinking about the basic meaning of the original statement, it's clear that we're supposed to be negating the disjunction and not just L. To make this clear, we need to add some punctuation to show we're negating the disjunction and not just the first simple proposition. This is where our parentheses come into play. Adding the parentheses separates the negation from the disjunction of L and K. Now, we have a well-formed formula. In this next example, we have three logical operators, a disjunction and two conjunctions. To see how to symbolize this, let's spell out the statement more clearly. Notice, in the original statement, we have a comma between the disjunction but before the conjunction. This tells us that the conjunction is joining L or K and S and M. Hence, we need parentheses around L or K and around S and M. Note how this clearly shows that the conjunction is joining the two together. This is a well-formed formula. This is also what we call the main operator because it will be the last logical operation to be performed on this statement, but we'll learn more about that later. Now let's suppose that we wanted to deny our previous assertion. We have the same proposition, but we want to deny it. Given that the conjunction was the main operator, we can't simply put a tilde at the beginning of the proposition. That would deny only that L or K but we want to deny the conjunction of L or K and S and M. This means we need brackets to show that the negation is now the main operator and it ranges over the whole statement. Now we have a denial of the conjunction and a well-formed formula. What we're beginning to see is the order of logical operations in a symbolized complex proposition. Parentheses mean do me first. The logical operator inside parentheses will always be performed first, reading left to right. Then we move on to the next operation. Since in this case the tilde falls outside the brackets, it will be the last, or the main, operator in this proposition. Of course, we could end up with even more complex propositions like this one. Notice how the negation outside of the braces is the main operator. Remember that the order of operations always applies in propositional logic. Parentheses mean do me first, bracket braces mean do me second, sorry, brackets mean do me second, and braces mean do me third, and so on. Okay, that's it for now. Next time, we'll learn how to construct and use truth tables to determine all of the possible truth values of complex propositions.